Hello everyone, I'm Professor Mark Baines with Concordia University and this is Advanced Exercise Physiology or Exercise Physiology for Sport. This is week 8 and we're now talking about preventing chronic disease and factors that affect performance. Before we get into those concepts, concepts we should now have clarified through previous chapters, through previous units, uh, are first and foremost the recognition of the differences between uh, heart rate versus VO2 max versus RPE versus force output. When we say intensity, make sure we're always clear about when we're talking about it or when we're applying it, uh, what we're referring to when we refer to intensity. We're referring to effort, we want giving you all out effort. You want them to be a level 10 RPE? Well, if you're going for a long run, that would make no sense. But if we're going for all out sprint, that does make sense. If we're gonna go on a five minute interval type uh, or for endurance athletes, or we're gonna go for even 60 seconds, we're not looking for level 10. You're not gonna be able to give level 10. Uh, that said, you wanna tell them you're given near maximal effort and in a high enough effort they can give, as much as they can give for 60 seconds, might give them the perception of a level 10 by the end, but not the very beginning. So we gotta understand all those kinds of things when it comes to the application of these concepts. Heart rate, we're using never never again please never again use it as a floor to get to let's get to 120 beats a minute let's get to 130 beats a minute let's get to your 70 percent max heart rate and we're not trying to get to it we want to make sure we don't go above a certain heart rate knowing that we go to a certain heart rate uh, we're going to see diminishing performance depending upon the athlete so we have to know our individual athletes very very well to know if know if we get to a certain heart rate are we going to see decline in multiple sets are they going to start uh, going down in their performance because they got to such a high heart rate during this set, during this drill, during this sprint, during this interval. Make sure we know that. We have to figure this out after several times of working with our athletes. In the beginning, it's always a difficult thing. That's why we want to assess. If they're speed power athletes, we need to assess their speed and power capabilities appropriately so we know where they roughly are for 100% effort. 100% uh, maximal force output, excuse me, uh, let alone their maximal performance. Same goes for any other sport, for any other level of training. Uh, VO2 max tends, tends to be anywhere up to, uh, it's pretty similar to heart rate. We start getting 95 to 100% output on 95 to 100% effort. But uh, generally speaking, at lower levels to mid levels, we're talking about probably 10, 20% higher VO2 max than heart rate. Uh, or, I'm sorry, the other way around. Uh, VO2 max being like 40% is about a 60% uh, max heart rate, whereas a 50% VO2 max equates to closer to 70%. Uh, of a max heart rate. So it can actually be a significant difference between the two, okay? Now that said, we need to make sure we're clear about uh, what our goal is for our given set, for our given interval, and be clear at all times. And I'm always gonna ask you questions. You'll be able to recite it quickly uh, with the expectation is heart rate versus VO2 max versus RPE versus force output, what you're expecting from your athletes. Knowing full well when you start talking about high RPE, you can't be expecting too many sets then. No one's going to be able to give you, if, if your goal is to have similar force output repeatedly, and you're going to have to have rest for that as well, right? It comes back to energy systems and muscle fiber types as well. Uh, various forms of strength. Well, maximal strength. Uh, we're talking about uh, maximal exertion from a standpoint of maximal load you can move, right? Now we're talking about something that tends to be slow velocity. Because load is high, velocity has to be low. It's not really a choice there because the load is so high. We talk about power or speed. Well, we're talking about redu reducing the amount of time you're moving a given load or, or, or moving in general. Consequently, you need to be doing it faster. The load itself is not so much important as how quickly you move. We talk about power or explosive activity. We want to make displace as much space in like a vertical jump or get across as much or go a great given distance in a certain amount of time and get farther and farther with that distance in that same short amount of time if the goal is to increase power or explosiveness. Endurance related strength, now we're talking about the capacity to be able to maintain levels of strength for longer and longer periods of time. We've got to make sure we're clear about what we're looking at with our athletes. And many of us, I think, have a hard time, and I understandably so, comprehending that for given sports like baseball, like volleyball, like basketball, like football, uh, any sport really, but certainly those sports in particular that are really big in North America and the United States that uh, have combinations of factors of the agility, the speed, the power, the endurance, the strength, and trying to figure out, well, what am I going to focus on most? Well, part of it comes into how you play, how you want your athletes to be able to play when they're out there, knowing full well, however, that there are certain limitations when it comes to the ability to produce 
force at high levels of output repeatedly. There's only so much you can do. So what players always do, every player will do it. If you're left on the field for a length amount of time, or if they're left on the court for a lengthy amount of time, you're not going to see someone running the entire time in basketball or soccer. Uh, you're just not going to see it. Volleyball, not moving your feet the entire time. It's just not going to happen because you can't produce that level of force on a regular basis and expect to be reactive for a long match or a long game or, uh, any, or a long event of any kind. So we have to take all those things into account and just think clearly about our expectations of our athletes, knowing full well that for, they're always going for minutes at a time. They're using more and more toward aerobic level energy output. If they're going intermittent periods of working with rest periods of at least 30 seconds, where they're not really doing much of anything at all for 30 seconds or more, 30, 90 seconds-ish, well, they're probably more glycolytic in that respect. And it's not just about work. It's also about rest. It goes both ways. If either work or rest is affected, that affects the energy system. Okay, and only in situations where rest is very, very long and work is very, very short are you really talking about maximal 95 plus percent uh, force output. When you see alignment is a great example to me in football, uh, when they're on the field and they have to repeatedly stay on the field defensively or offensively. You start to see them start the offensive line starts letting guys get in more and more because they just can't produce that same level of force every time. You're not going to see it. You can condition him all you want. You got a 300 pound guy. There's only so much force he can put out there for several seconds and only have a 30, 45 second break. It's not going to be enough to get or generate full ATP. So we have to take that into account. And whether we try to find ways of subbing guys in and out, we try to run play to the other side of the field, right? Uh, coaches are very good, the ones that are really good at what they do, at understanding that there's only so much athletes can actually put out there relative to their competition, relative to themselves. We have to take that into account how we train, how we practice, how we prepare. Uh, muscle fiber types involved in activity. Uh, we're talking about short dirt burst and ultra short term, that one to 10 second time frame. It's mostly type 2X. Um, still some type 2X involved for exertions that are a little longer than that, or but as long as they're high output. Uh, we're talking about 75% plus VO2 max. We're talking about type 2X muscle fibers. We're talking about 40 to 75% VO2 max. It's predominantly type 2A muscle fibers. And anything that's under 40% VO2 max or roughly 60% max heart rate or under, we're talking about majority of being might try toward uh, type 2 and muscle fiber type involvement. That's going to vary to some extent. Those are good numbers in general to understand what we're expecting from our athletes at a given level of output uh, relative to our, our level of effort. Okay. Um, applying the science versus being exact, you know, we're not trying to be perfectly exact with everything that we do, but when we talk about it, we're trying to be as exact as possible in our planning and our programming and precision when we explain it. I was pretty hard on some of you guys with your papers because I expected more out of you. doesn't mean you're not going to pass the class or not going to do well, but I'm going to be hard on you because I want you to be clear so you can best help our athletes. So it all comes back to every time I read something from you, hopefully every time you go over a chapter in your textbook or listen to a lecture video here, you're thinking about how is this going to benefit my athletes? How can I make the best use of this to help the people I want to help or maybe helping my own athletic performance? right? Uh, that's the goal. And so if I'm hard on you, that's why, okay? But that said, uh, we want to make sure we're always getting better. We want to keep improving upon it. We're not going to be exact, but that is always, whoops, that is always the goal, to be as exact as possible without necessarily getting there, right? Uh, and of course, make sure you're reading and respond to others before you post. Um, it's probably best if you actually look at some other posts, if you haven't figured this out already, um, and respond to them before you make your own post. Because really, you should be able to actually benefit from actually seeing early posts. People who post first shouldn't necessarily have the best posts. Now, if they do, well, kudos to them, kudos to all of you, the first or second poster for each given week and who may or may not have the best posts of the week. That's a credit to you and how much effort you're putting forth and what you're putting into your posts. But that said, what should be happening with the successive posters, people who post later in the day, you should be looking at someone else's post before you finalize your own to see what maybe they're putting in there that you're not and be able to build upon that and grow with that. And of course, every single one of you, you know I'm going to give you a chance to actually improve upon your post, to add more, to grow more from it. And I highly encourage you when I ask you questions to look at other people's posts. You're not going to see my sample post to get the clarity and exactly what I want from you uh, to be able to, to actually put in your post. You're not going to be able to see that until the next week. Then you can go, oh, okay, that's what you're getting at when you want me to talk more about VO2 max at that given level of exertion or what muscle fiber type should be involved at this point or why they need 90 seconds rest or what specifically the benefit is for why the fatigue is such a crucial component of this particular uh, program we're working on. Those kinds of things. But you should be looking at other people's posts to grow in this. That's why we're all here. None of us are going to get better by ourselves. We never do. I don't know about you, 
Have you ever tried to be a top-level, top-tier athlete by yourself? I did. I don't know if I made that clear before or not, but I was uh, 29 years old now, almost 20 years ago, and I moved down to Southern California. My goal was to be an Olympic-level athlete, a 800-meter runner, and the fact of the matter was uh, that I was about 7%, 7% off from qualifying for the Olympics, okay? Olympic trials off about 4%, okay, for qualifying for Olympic trials. That subtle difference of 4 to 7% being essentially elite uh, high school, top tier, mid middle tier college, middle to higher tier college, and not even close to top tier elite. Uh, there's a monstrous difference there in jumps. A few percent, a few percent, that's it. That's why it's so crucial that we are as exact as possible when we do these things. If someone's off five to 10% their performance on a given day, there's something wrong in what we're doing. Regardless of the goal being high intensity, it's not happening. Change something in what you're doing, because that five or ten percent, ten five to ten percent difference can make all the difference in actual performance. Okay, let alone even smaller percentage points. Right. Uh, that said, going into week eight here, uh, chronic disease risk, uh, biological risk, uh, but depending upon your heritage, your background, uh, given ethnicity, given area, where given uh, background from where your ethnic background comes from and the parts of the world and his historically, uh, whether you're male or female, uh, depending upon uh, numerous factors that go into the lineage of your family, right? Uh, all those things are biological. Age, as you age, it's biological. You can't do anything about that. All those things are things that you have no control over uh, that, do, however, do affect us. And we won't really know the implications of that until we engage in exertion and find out. Um, some of that stuff may be known to the given athlete who might tell you certain things because they can tell you about what their family background is from the standpoint of chronic uh, heart disease problems or other related issues with the, maybe with diabetes, whatnot. Um, they will tell you that. But a lot of things are unknown. They won't be known until we start exerting. But you got to pay attention to that because that's going to affect them. No matter what you do, it will still affect them. Every athlete is different. Environmentally, certainly whether it's hot or cold, humid or not, uh, we're talking about indoors, outdoors, surface-wise, what they're on, uh, what they're moving on, right? For the hard, hard pack, uh, like concrete or soft, like sand, whatever it might be, in that environment in general can greatly impact. Uh, what's going on with given athletes and of course the environment often affects behavior as well behaviorally we're talking about the not just how they act in general but uh, drinking smoking uh, eating habits uh, stress outside practice and games that you can't always control what's going on with their social circles uh, socioeconomically how it's affecting them what's going on at home with money affecting how they can pay for school or make ends meet to buy books or whatever's going on with them all those things play a role and your ability to keep in touch with your athletes beyond the confines of practice and games of course will help you immensely with that and when it comes to the practice itself you can absolutely impact behavior and environment by how you interact with your with your athletes uh, and you got to know the times to recognize to push to back off by looking at reading their faces people will show you they're tired long before they'll tell you they're tired you can see it in their faces let alone they'll they're breathing and how heavily they're breathing but you'll see facial expressions before you see anything else in body language right you can tell a tired athlete without even looking at their face by how they move right You've got to be looking at those things uh, inflammation can be insidious um, it can be very uh, gradual over time or it can like very chronic or it can become more, very, very acute, right? With an acute injury or acute problem that's causing so much pain, discomfort, uh, the athlete can't continue with what they're doing to any reasonable extent and have to completely rest. There's the chronic inflammation, though, that's really tough to see until it's too late. And that was one of the things that affected me with my goals of making the Olympic team uh, and really far from it, but really becoming an elite athlete, uh, was inflammation from a standpoint of all the chronic stress of pushing too hard uh, when I should be backing off and not understanding when's the time to push, when's the time to back off. And that's one of the advantages of having a good coach. You can behaviorally affect your decision making and also environmentally affect the place you do things. Also, one of the big things you'll, you'll hopefully recall from, I believe it's chapter 19, uh, talking about something as simple as a distraction uh, while well, between intervals. Uh, where someone talks about something random or you're doing math in your head or thinking about your boyfriend or girlfriend, anything like that that truly distracts you from what you're doing can actually have a tremendous benefit to your next interval or set. Being distracted, 
All right? As long as it's not taking you from completely what you're doing, but distracted enough during between during the respite interval, then being focused during the set can have tremendous benefits and higher performance, right? Not getting too stressed out, essentially, right? We're talking about what can keep your stress levels at a low level as much as possible during the rest, because that's the whole goal, is to rest. Be careful with talking about interval work whereby we refer to being active during the rest. Yes active within a relative degree of allowing you to recover. If you're moving and doing enough, you can't recover, kind of defeats the purpose of the activity during the rest period. There's gonna be some variations there. But inflammation, essentially the white blood cells rushing to a given area, uh, tissue area where there's damage there. That can be related to just simple physiological, I'm sorry, psychological stress can affect inflammation. People can get hives, can get rashes, uh, can just be so stressed out that it affects their blood flow, their heart rate, their blood pressure, right? And of course, white blood cells will rush to an area to assist if there's if too much stress is in being incurred in any given area, which is why people develop over time chronic related issues. And that's why we need to pay so close attention to day-to-day -to -day progress with, the, with our athletes. The more you can write down and track, or you have hopefully student, maybe some student helpers that actually can, uh, student managers or whatnot, or other assistant coaches that help out to track data while one or more coaches are actually doing more of the work, someone else can track. Maybe you alternate that kind of thing. Because the more you can track with actual output as much as possible, the better you're going to be able to gauge what you can and can't do with your athletes on a given day to maximize their performance when it counts the most. Uh, central versus peripheral fatigue. Well, central fatigue, when you're just tired and worn down and you don't feel like you're you're hurting, you're in pain, but you're just beat up, that's central fatigue, okay? That's going to take longer to recover from. Going to need to get a good night's rest, going to need to get plenty of water, going to need to get a lot of carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is the most predominant macronutrient outside of water that you need to be taking in to a predominant degree when someone's fatigued. Someone gets nauseated, sick to their stomach, um, or lightheaded, uh, that kind of thing during practice. One of the pre most predominant things is number one thing is water, second thing is carbohydrate. If you're lacking those things, you'll see a dramatic downturn in performance, and they will get to the point where they're uh, falling around or looking or they're dizzy or lightheaded or having difficulty with normal motor control. Not good, right? Peripheral fatigue. Well, if you're lifting weights or you're running sprints, you're going to have more localized to those muscle groups that are actually working predominantly in a given motor skill uh, where those are going to get fatigued. You might not be systemically worn down, central nervous system wise, but peripherally you are, right? So it can vary dramatically depending upon what's going on. Central fatigue, the session needs to be over or immediately go to low intensity and recovery. If it's peripheral fatigue, maybe you can change the activity to something else that's not affecting that same area. Uh, in the same way. But you're going to be very clear about the differences in those types of fatigue in your athletes. With ultra short level uh, intensity or output, uh, 1 to 10 seconds, we're talking about a sprint. We're talking about sprint, we're talking about maximal force output of at least 95 to 100% intensity. 90% uh, is going to be more likely in the low end or the early stages of the short duration, which is like 10 seconds to about 60 seconds ish, somewhere in there for 90 plus percent max force output, right? Start getting two to three minutes in the short duration. Uh, work period, still short, relatively speaking, but your output's going to be dropping down closer to 70% max force output during that time frame. And of course, as it goes more into moderate, 3 to 20 minutes, now we're talking about maximally getting as much as 70% max output um, stamping up for something for 20 minutes long, right? Intermediate going down as low as like 60% or under, and long one plus four hours, you're going to be looking at 50, 60% of maximal force output or less, uh, maybe as low as 40% for something that's really, really long uh, duration intensity-wise from a standpoint of force output. And then again, during all those things, you might have an RPE of 9 or 10, but your actual force output's going to drop as you progress for longer duration activity at your highest level effort in that duration of activity, right? Um, heart rate's going to increase. The longer you go at high in, higher intensity, the harder you're trying to go, the longer you go, heart rate's going to keep increasing to some extent However, as we said before, stroke volume should ideally be going up to high level, high enough level whereby heart rate does not rise significantly. If you remember, around 40-60% of your VO2 max, someone who's deconditioned, stroke volume is going to, going to cease increasing, actually going to drop. As it drops, heart rate will rise up significantly around the 40-60% VO2 max for deconditioned athletes. And you might see a slight difference in that for someone who's somewhat conditioned. Top conditioned athletes up to about 100% VO2 max. 
Um, their stroke volume is going to be sufficient, so consequently, even at 100% VO2 max, heart rate's not going to be significant. They're not going to be significantly up. It's going to come down very fast. That's very important for you to understand. But you got to be clear about, are my athletes ultra short-term athletes, whereby activity is always 1 to 10 seconds? Okay, fair enough, but if their rest period is only 5 seconds... Now we're talking about kind of more like short duration activity more here because they're actually getting the, on the low end of this, okay? If rest periods are short, football players are more and more in this kind of category uh, depending upon if they're on the field for long periods of time. It also affects it. They might be more on a given game or a given sequence, more, more toward this type uh, of performance, whereas at some point they're more toward this. Same with the basketball player, volleyball player, volleyball player less or so, but still somewhat, depending on the difference between beach and indoor right? Uh, six players versus two. It's a big difference there. Uh, and of course, moderate duration for more type uh, athletes who are engaging in consistent activity for longer. Uh, wrestlers on the low end of that, fighters on the low end of that, and of course endurance athletes going more toward middle distance type athletes uh, for durations that are in that range as well. And you got to be clear about what energy system you're using at that time frame, what muscle fiber types are predominantly being used in that time frame, and then of course what rest period you need to be requiring during that time frame, what you expect for heart rate to be during that time frame, uh, what your uh, VO2 max roughly speaking is in that time frame. All those things need to be taken into account to affect uh, your recognition of increasing performance or increasing fatigue. Okay. And final thoughts. Be careful about post-regression. As you get near the end of the class, uh, every class, I see it all the time in some people. Some of you haven't and some of you won't. Some of you are seeing it a little bit and you're actually declining your, in your, your posts because it's almost like you feel, I haven't had a couple posts that have gotten very good grades, so what's the point? The point is your athletes. The point is your athletes and getting them better and showing that in these posts. And, of course, I'm going to drive you with that because I want you to get better. And I don't know if you're getting better until you show me. And that's how we do that, okay? And that said, don't regress. You don't want your athletes to get worse over the course of the season. I don't want you to fall back over the course of this 11-week course, which is essentially, um, roughly speaking, a short season of athletics, right? About three months. Kind of the same kind of thing, right? It's hard to keep an athlete going. It's also hard to keep a student going. Uh, teachers have a hard time, too. We all do. We can't accept regression. We have to keep our same level of effort or increasing that level of effort, of effort or at least getting smarter about how much effort we give, right? Let me know, as always, how I can help you out. Knowing full well, though, the second test is coming up here. The second test is going to be up this week. And uh, it's going to be 100 questions once again. And I'm going to give you some guiding questions to help you with that exam that such that if you can actually answer those questions, they're going to be open-ended. There's not going to be answers given to you. You need to be able to see that question and know I know what that answer is. If you do know those answers, you'll do quite well on your exam. If you don't, you're going to have a hard time. Okay. That said, as always, call or email me if you have questions. We are nearing the end, the final few weeks here anyway, so we're, you know, third quarter, late third quarter, if you will, uh, or at least the third to three out of four, if you will, near the end of our uh, our uh, time together. Please let me know if you have questions that I can help you with. The goal is to get the most out of it for the limited time we have, and I hope to keep seeing you improve, and I hope to do all I can to help you out. Let me know.